what I would also like to do is basically to propose that the, uh, uh, in addition to the built project as ephemera, the unbuilt project as ephemera too, uh, <laughs> meaning think of all the design competitions that had all the, you know, there's a winner and then there are all the other projects that uh, get forgotten. So, uh, so I wanted to yeah, and also simulate in architecture what Tani was talking about yesterday, which is to find that insignificant little drawing somewhere, and then with a bit of research, extract out of it a kind of eminent history um, that you didn't expect it had. Uh, <clears throat> so I thought I could simulate that in architecture. And I'm going to do it, and I'm going to take you to the other side of the world to do so. Um, uh, we're going to Brazil. Uh, <clears throat> so, hold on. Can you see? Yeah. So, 52 years ago, government functionaries and foreign ambassadors uh, traveled to Brazil's interior to participate uh, in the, what were called the Solidarity Installation of the Federal in Brazil which literally translates as the installation solemnities uh, of the federal government in Brazil. Essentially, <coughs> Brazil had decided in 1955, well, it had decided even at the end of the 19th century to do so, but in 1955, they decided to move on, to move, uh, to actually get the project going of moving the capital of the country inland, and by 1960, by that day, uh, they did it. Okay, so festivities began the afternoon of April, April 20, 1960, on the plaza of the Three Powers, um, where the president of Brazil, Juscelino Kubitschek, received the keys of, to the city from the head of Novacap, the agency that uh, was basically in charge of this massive project of moving an entire federal capital somewhere else. So that night, a mass was celebrated at midnight. And at 12.45, Pope John uh, 23 uh, addressed the people of Brazil from the, from the Vatican via live radio. Um, the following morning at 8.30 a.m., you're looking at it. Kubitschek received the diplomatic corps in the Planalto Palace. You're looking at the ambassadors from behind and the palace where they were going to go in to hand in their uh, letters. <clears throat> An hour later, at 9.30 a.m., all three branches of government were simultaneously installed in their respective executive, legislative, and here the, uh, sorry, and the, judici the judiciary. At 10.15 a.m., the Archdiocese of Brasilia installed, uh, by the papal nuncio, was installed by the papal nuncio, and at 11.30, so on the right of the image, a solemn session was held in Congress with all guests present. Military parades were held that afternoon, which culminated in a massive uh, fireworks display. That evening, what Brasilia's population party on the plaza of the three powers. Dignitaries died in tales in the Panalto Palace. This, if you read the caption, it says, Democracy. The ambassador, the ambassador of the United States and his wife uh, opened the way in the middle of the sidewalk. This is on their way to the palace in Brasilia in 1960. So, uh, this just shows the same thing again. Uh, this, this magazine is slightly more critical. What now, Joe uh, Taka, what now, Mr. President? Uh, 
the great show of, of uh, tiredness. Um, Brasilia, the night of science fiction. <laughs> a Martian would not be surprised. <laughs> okay, so this is just to give you a bit of context. Um, all those who went, so ambassadors, uh, uh, senators, all those who were there at this thing were given an invitation, uh, a program, and this is it. Um, so all those who participated in this momentous occasion received in their invitation packages a program printed by the Geographic Institute, by the, the Graphic Service of the Brazil Geographic and Statistics Institute, in fact, uh, in Rio de Janeiro. So it's an insignificant little thing, <laughs> well, insignificant, but as ephemera as it can get, it's an invitation program. The program which featured on its blue cover uh, a, a, a column drawn by Oscar Niemeyer uh, of the Alvorada Palace. And just so I situate things, because I'm going to be talking about them, uh, the, the project for designing the, Brazilian, the new Brazilian capital in 1957 was a design competition. The man who won the competition was Lucio Costa. And then um, the man in charge of the division of Nova Cap, the agency, the division of urbanism and architecture, the head of that division was Oscar Niemeyer, who passed away a few days ago, who had 104. So he, his charge was to run the competition um, in order to have someone design the city, but to also design the future buildings within whoever wins that competition. So, just so you know. So this invitation program also contained a map of the city that showed in red where events were to take place uh, while, uh, and while this document, a mere invitation brochure, can be safe, safely defined as an ephemera, it is about another category uh, of ephemera altogether that I'd like to talk about today and which coincidentally appear briefly in time in this very ephemeral document. Uh, <coughs> Just to be clear, the category of ephemera, which I'd like to define, um, uh, are, um, consist of architecture's unbuilt projects that have historically made promising appearances, only to fade away in time and memory. They nonetheless leave significant traces behind. So just to situate you, so if you had been a, a guest to, these, to this event, you would have received this map, and the map shows in uh, essentially uh, where you'll be at what, what time, the red dots, you know, there's going to be a military parade here, the ball will be there, etc. So, and this is what has happened since. So even though only a fraction of the city's architecture had in fact been directed by then, by the, at the time of the, the, the invitation, just about every building indicated in the 1960, in the 1960 map uh, did eventually get built as planned, except for two major projects that I'm going to go through. <clears throat> so two projects that have a kind of puzzling presence in the map. Uh, and that do require the kind of hermeneutic scrutiny that Tani Barlow was talking about yesterday, uh, since they only appear in this map and don't appear technically anywhere else. Uh, so they are the, the Brazilian airport, a round airport. Uh, and then the University of Brasilia, which is this kind of weird cellular uh, company. Now, they appear in this map, they also appear in one other map um, uh, distributed that same year and uh, presumably the invitation map was based on, on this map. Uh, <coughs> now, they do not appear in the original plan for the project, which is what you're looking This is by Lucio Costa. Uh, actually, this is a better view. Uh, 
so this is the Brazilian airport as Lucio Costa designed it way back, and uh, this is how it eventually got built. This is what it looks like, just to have that in mind. And then the Brasilia uh, plan, uh, the, the university plan, as it was designed in 1957, in fact, and as it is now. Here it is what it looks like now. So, no cellular organization, quite the culture, linear. <laughs> so, so, for anyone familiar with the history of Brasilia, they might be inclined to attribute the authorship of the uh, the Mystery Ground Airport to Oscar Niemeyer, who was in charge actually of uh, designing all the major uh, buildings in the city. So, uh, so, in other words, if you show this to any anyone who knows about Brazil, they go, oh, of course, that's by Oscar Niemeyer. And in fact, they, there is in the archives of Oscar Niemeyer a round airport. Uh, there's a catch. Uh, our mystery airport dates from 1960, while the Oscar Niemeyer is from 1965, so it couldn't be um, that one. The only project, the only project for a round airport in existence at the time had been designed two years earlier, so in 1958. Uh, by, by another architect, Sergio Bernardes, who, as far as everyone knows, had nothing to do with Brazil. <clears throat> In 1958, Bernardes had been chosen to design the Brazil Pavilion for the Brussels uh, World's Fair, but as far as history books go, um, he was never meant to design the future airport of Brazil's capital at a time when the architect of choice would have been Oscar Niemeyer who designed just about every other public building in Brasilia. Bernardes was certainly not part of the team, the original team working on Brasilia um, in the late 50s and the 60s and early 60s, and he only got to build in Brasilia major projects from 1970 onward. He had two projects. This is one of them, the, the national last, as it's called. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm referring to that. <clears throat> Regarding the other mystery projects of the university campus, one can only presume that it was designed by Lucio Costa, who, as I just told you, designed the city itself, and in fact, uh, uh, he did design, the, in 1962 at least, uh, there is a project of Lucio Costa for the Brasilia project, which has a kind of cellular organization. Not that it does actually did. So the presence of these, sorry, the presence of these two uh, projects in the first official map uh, of Brazil's new federal capital, an official map that only appears really um, in, a, in an invitation, <clears throat> implies that at least until the city's inauguration, they both belong to a list of projects that were likely to be com completed at some point. While they were never built, they nonetheless hold with, within them eminent histories that have preceded them and, in fact, that have since followed. And they, so through them, one can actually unravel this kind of strange history I'm going to go through now. How am I doing on time? Even though Sergio Bernardes did not push the guy from the airport, did not officially design buildings in Brasilia un until 1970. His presence there, in Brasilia, had in fact occurred a few years even earlier, when Costa was still making the sketches of his eventual 1957 winning competition entry for the city. One of Costa's earliest sketches for Brasilia, drawn while he was on a ship coming back from New York to Rio, um, you can see the letterhead, this is the Rio Rachal. Um, includes a recognizable popsicle silhouette of Bernardes' 1956 proposal 
uh, for the Senate, for the Federal Senate uh, uh, building in Rio de Janeiro. So 1955, uh, Rio was still undecided. Well, the Brazil had still not completely decided to to move, um, and they did have a design. They did have a design uh, competition for a, uh, a new Senate building in Rio, and it had a. I'll show it to you in a minute. It had a kind of obstacle profile, as it was referred to in the press, Picolet, uh, which is that profile. And that profile appears, uh, actually, I'll show it to you. Um, in other words, Costa used the profile, uh, uh, Bernardis's distinctly shaped project, as a possible model for the, com for the country's uh, future national congress. And, uh, Scotch, uh, and basically, uh, Costa Sketch combines Bernardis's high-rise project with a uh, low-domed uh, rise building. So, so in other words, he lifts the, the Picolet building, the popsicle building, and adds to it a low sort of Congress hall next to it. This is just a sketch. Never appears again. In fact, So let's get back first to the airport. Uh, <clears throat> based on oral history, Lucio Costa did take the project of the supersonic airport, as it was called, uh, to the president, President Kubitschek, who supposedly did envisage building it. And this is oral history through um, one of the draftsmen of Sergio Bernardes, who worked with him at the time on the project. Um, the assumption then was that the project would pay for itself at a time when the city could, could not yet provide the necessary travel volume. It, it's basically a weird airport that has a shopping center in the middle of the casino. The casino. <laughs> um, Impossibility of renewing his mandate. Kubitschek was elected in 1955. He had only one term. You could, at the time, one could not repeat a presidential term. So Kubitschek uh, must have deferred the project's implementation when he thought he would return to power five years later. A year before the anticipated 1965 elections, however, Brazil underwent a military coup which forestalled his second uh, Kubitschek mandate and presumably set back Bernardus's chances to see his air airport ever built. <clears throat> now, in fact, once you start looking, uh, you can find in a German, in German press a little article that refers to the Intercontinental Air, air Terminal of Brasilia by Sergio Bernardes. This is in 1963. So the project seems to have remained viable, at least in some imaginary until 1963, when one can actually find references in, uh, in international press uh, for it. After all, Brazil's new capital had been surveyed by air, it had the shape of a plane, and it was at least for a while solely accessible uh, by air. So it was therefore only natural to equip the city with a visionary airport, one that sets uh, new standards for negotiating the complex relationship between the servicing of planes and the management of passengers. One more. So using the model of an aircraft carrier, um, Bernardis' solution was to stack all airport functions vertically, thereby separating the above-ground structure on a scale fit for giant flying machines uh, from levels below meant to serve people uh, and their cars. Essentially, think of it as the same way on, a, on an aircraft carrier, you service the plane from underneath, uh, you take a giant aircraft carrier shove it in the ground and you get this Brazilian airport. <laughs> so what is remarkable about this airport is not only that it separated functions according to their distinct scales, giant machines above people like ants running underneath, um, but it also, that it also had no known precedent. In other words, the round airport until then, did not exist. By 1965, plans for its constructions in Brasilia were abandoned and Bernardes turned to Rio de Janeiro as a possible alternative. Uh, this was at a time when Rio was trying to reinvent itself as a, you know, 
no longer the capital of the nation. So um, uh, this is a, an article. Uh, Sergio Bernardes projects in Rio uh, in the cybernetic age uh, the future that has just begun. Um, uh, admirable Rio, uh, new, new, new admirable world. Rio. I'll go through it quickly. And here's the airport this time. It's no longer for Brazilian, now it's for Rio. And then, I'm not, I mean, this would also, I was, uh, for the sake of time, I was also going to talk about these. In fact, the abstract, which I completely abandoned, um, <laughs> was going to be a, a, a history of Rio de Janeiro through its unbid projects. And this was the, the prime candidate of the month. Um, <coughs> trying to synchronize my laptop. Oh, okay. So, the very rotundity of this airport uh, was eventually taken up by a French architect, Paul Andre. You know the project. Uh, uh, and Paul Andre did, did this for his 1967 Charles de Gaulle or Roissy Airport near Paris, inaugurated in 1974. This is especially evident when their plans are compared side by side. So in other words, this is the Brasilia airport and this is the Paris airport with uh, a few years gap between. And the French got to build the round airports, the Brazilians didn't. <laughs> uh, and it is basically organized the same way, you get to the planes from underneath. The only difference is that this stops short of the previous project, which is to use the runway as, as the roof of a building underneath, where you can send stuff up uh, to the plate. To the so, um, now I think I can touch it. Um, so now the same, what can be the same with this, sort of, who the hell designed this? Um, and in fact, um, if one were to look at the, the history of uh, federal of federal university campuses in Brazil, um, uh, many architects way back worked on that one. And uh, in 1936, Le Corbusier, a French architect, Franco-Swiss architect, uh, was invited specifically to come to Rio, spend a month, and design uh, the university campus. Uh, at the time, the Ministry of Education had this program of the new Brazilian man, um, and it absolutely required as a central, uh, as a central sort of icon of this giant national program, this amazing federal campus, uh, federal university campus designed by the famous architects. So, uh, the, unfortunately, uh, the commission of professors who had to approve or not approve this project said, uh, out of the question. Mm -hmm. um, and one of their major complaints was that the center was void, that in fact it was too dispersed. So while for Le Corbusier, the void was a kind of metaphysical void on which to see an architecture and so forth, for the professors, uh, they were like, uh, no way. Um, uh, so, Lucio Costa, who was in fact in charge of the commission to design the the university campus, and who faced with this abrupt uh, rejection from the, the Commission of Professors, decides to do his own project right after, so a month later, uh, after Le Corbusier, and does the opposite, a centralized program, a centralized distribution with an axis down the middle. Um, but I wanted to pay attention to this part especially, which is the entrance, the Praça Mayor, the sort of the main portico of the university. Um, in other words, this guy here. Um, so now it's the op it's the anti corbu modern project. Which is, so while Corbusier is about the void and an, em an emptiness and so forth, this is about congestion and centrality and so forth. It has a it has a beginning, it has an end. Um, in fact, it looks like Brasilia, even though we're in 1936. Uh, <laughs> but that's outside. Uh, but uh, nonetheless. Um, uh, Costa used one of Corbus' buildings, hoping to kind of as a consolation prize, to 
to give him at least a building to build. Le Corbusier was very famous in 1936, but he had not built very much. Um, so, um, anyway, um, so this is the Lucio Costa version of the, so this is the portico. You go in through this monumental gate, this is inside, this is the uh, secretariat, or the administration, and then uh, the kind of assembly hall.
and kind of the Kiriko or Giacometti or as a still life, as a kind of uh, bibelots strewn about. Back to the university campus. Uh, if one looks even further, one finds these drawings of the portico of the, of the university. But this time, the portico no longer designed by Lucio Costa, but designed by Oscar Niemeyer. Now, you have to keep in mind that the Brasilia was designed by Lucio Costa, Oscar Niemeyer, they call the public buildings, but they tend to kind of work on each other's projects. It's hard to, in fact, at some point disassociate. Uh, so this is by Oscar. Uh, think of the Giacometti strewn about, big blows, still life, etc. Um, and then it gets slightly more solidified. The tall, the tall building with the assembly hall next to it uh, remain as paradigms, but they will. So, so, and then it gets published in 1962 in a book by the university. <coughs> as such, uh, so this is now the auditorium. Think of the United Nations as the model. But then the version proceeds, the tall building disappears. Um, so we go from here to here, um, no more tall building. And then suddenly a little drawing appears where in fact it's Lucio Costa trying to fit the, the Oscar Niemeyer portico inside his own portico uh, plan. Um, and then uh, Oscar Niemeyer designs one more project for, uh, for the campus, the Institute for Scientific Research, essentially all the classrooms, I think. Um, and that is inserted again uh, in the plan. Uh, so now I, I forgot to preface that if you ask anyone today, does the University Campus of Brasilia have a plan? Everyone would say no, it was done, you know, um, it was done accidentally, they had a building as we, you know, uh, so in other words, a bit like the airport, the reference is no longer there in, uh, in any particular narrative. <coughs> so and this is the long building. <coughs> so in other words, um, I should end. Well, I, depending on how much time I have, I can do so a bit. Okay. I can stop. No, no, I'll, I'll stop. Um, so essentially, what began as a, as a, so in order to do the same exercise that Tani described yesterday, which is to begin with this insignificant little ad and then uh, flesh it all out, I suppose one can find an architecture and the equivalent, uh, be it either the unbuilt project stored somewhere, or um, strange manifestations of unbuilt project that are, are great starting points to, to figure them out. Thank you.